me in the ass, dude. Excuse me, but it feels good to write that. It'll feel better to say it, but you can't read that. Why am I in such a bad mood? Why have I been away for so long? Well, let me just start from the beginning. Approximately one year ago, after I lost it at the sit-down, Gupta, after the surprise death of the Godfather, he made it so that I wouldn't be able to leave the country, and I was now limited to the people I can make business with. It's been rough since I lost my parents, old man, and even Tyson. Even with me taking down Fregley and Chirag, eliminating the Godfather and Leland, things haven't gotten better. Ever since last year, with all the deaths and losses, things have been going downhill. To make matters worse, we lost Plainview. Yup, it all started when an FBI agent went missing in the area, which got some people turning heads our way. There was a full investigation after they found out about the mass killings and people missing. The remnants of Fregley's didn't even last a week. They were all either killed or sent to prison. However, just like what Fregley predicted, a new gang has risen from the ashes of his faction. But right now, they're really just acting as target practice for the cops. It was horrible. It took us two months to relocate to a disclosed area. I'm not saying where. We settled somewhere in another state, where we had always known this day would come, so we had backup areas to set up shop in case another was found out. In fact, we were in the middle of moving out when some stupid FBI agent named Patty Farrell came knocking toward the door. I wasn't there to see her, but based on what my goons told me, they were really suspicious about our business in the area. You see, as a cover of business, we sell lemonade and medicinal drugs. Totally not something suspicious. Yet, unfortunately, there was another investigation, and before I knew it, more and more of my goons got taken into custody and put in trial for organized crime. And sadly, the FBI connected the dots and eventually traced it all back to me. They had me in cuffs and put me into a trial in no time at all. I bet Rudo is having a blast watching this on TV. I bet that son of a bitch sent the FBI agent there in the first place. Those sons of a bitch just had me on trial for everything in the book. They even found a way to link me back to all those deaths caused by the Active Intelligent Dude Society gang. The only reason I didn't get butt f***ed in prison was because while I was being held in pre-trial detention, my goons finally decided to be useful and busted me out of my cell. It was all a blur with gunshots and dynamite being thrown. It was a complete mess. It was weird too. As I was running away, I saw a bunch of guys wearing the same jumpsuits as me. Later, I found out my goons didn't know which cell I was in, so they just started letting as many people out as they could find. I was going to tell them that the cells out window so the guards can see the prisoner, but what's done was done. Sometimes I ponder how I got this far with these kind of goons. But I digress. We almost lost our lives trying to get out of the building. Even if I was shot, it wouldn't have been the first time. Yeah, I really am glad I had my goons as meat shields. I mean, it could have been worse. I could have been killed. But that's why I have the goons. They just die for me. To make a long story short, we were able to get away from the cops. I was a water man, so I had to get a new identity and change my appearance. I even had to get rid of my old uniform. But I had to get rid of it eventually, since it was still used by the Italians. Speaking of Italians, they haven't really made a move since the Godfather's death. With the FBI checking the area, they have mostly gone underground, based on what I can tell. Except for one, Jordan Jury. The day after I killed the Godfather, he sent me an email saying that he knew I was the one responsible for his death. That he blamed himself for not killing me in the pizzeria. His last statement in that email was that he predicted by the end of the next year, I'd be dead. A little rude in my book, but what do I know? That was the last I've heard from him. Not even during the trials did he send me a I told you so email. As far as I know, he probably was killed by one of those FBI pigs. Then again, I might have heard about it from one of my goons if he died. Yet if their information gathering is as bad as everything else they do, that's probably not a surprise. Sadly, during this madness, I buried my original jury and feared they would find the evidence and use it against me. God knows that if they found that thing, I'd be in prison for longer than I can count. Uh, so, I don't know, four years? This Patty Farrell person is going to be the death of me, I swear. June. Tuesday. This morning I got a call from one of my casinos. Since every other country is off limits, I need to find more ways to make money. I don't like leaving others to manage my business for me, but it pays the bills. But I was ready to swallow that pill when I heard the news they had. Roderick is alive. Roderick, of all the people that I needed right now, was him. He may have been an ass, but he's the last bit of family I have. I thought Manny had killed him two years ago when he joined Al-Qaeda. To give you an update about how Manny is on his whole Al-Qaeda sh well, I got a word from an insider in the Middle East Mafia that when a couple of white Americans try joining Al-Qaeda, they usually end up on the other end of a stick. So that's something. For as excited as I was, I stopped to wonder if this was the trap. I never told anyone about my siblings except for Holly, and she's been away for a while. Someone could have done some digging and found out that way too. Either way, I'm ready to roll that dice to know if he's alive. Then I got into my car and brought two goons with me in case things went south. Can't be too careful. If I'm going to hear this information, I'm not going to be sitting at home twiddling my thumbs waiting for the information to come to me, only to come up false. Besides, how can the owner of a Sturdivant casino possibly be harmed? My only concerns are my goons. One of them asked me a question and now I feel 10% dumber. We arrived that night at the casino. It was crowded, but we went to the back to get inside. There are a couple of men waiting for me and escorted me into the back room where the manager was sitting. He greeted us and got drinks. I declined and demanded to know who knew where Roderick was. He looked a little upset when I asked him, but he snapped his fingers. His goons went to the closet and opened it up to reveal a beaten man with a gag in his mouth. 
The manager said that he had come here yesterday, saying that he had important news just for me. The manager stated that they had tried to beat the information out of him, but the fool would only give it to me. Yet, he was committed to getting me here. After all, he stated that he came all the way from Mexico to get me this information. He said that Roderick was being held captive by one of the Mexican mobsters. Of all places, Mexico is not my favorite. Unlike other countries where the mobsters are either just gangs with big guns or little underground world powers, Mexico is a mess. The cartels over there are powerful enough to be a threat, but they are so disorganized that their lieutenants usually stay in power for a couple of weeks. After that, they either disappear, jump the border, or become big chow. However, three big capos have managed to remain on top in Mexico. The port cartel with territory in the east, the coalition which is controlled in the west, and the main cartel in the north. We've worked with the main cartel before the ban. They supplied us the drugs we needed. South America is one big problem that I don't want to get involved with. Especially with my ban from all other countries still in effect. I think there's a drug war going on over there right now. Even if I wanted to help Roderick, I'd be a dead man if I stepped over a foot over the border. It wasn't even worth getting mad over. I told my goons to let him go and make sure I never spoke of this. My goons asked if I was going to kill him, but I wasn't in the mood. This morning, I got up from trying to figure out a way to get Roderick into America. The Mexican dude didn't specify who the guy was, just some Mexican mobsters. The main gang broke ties with us after the coup, so asking them for help was out of the question. I was so upset that I called in the goons for a meeting. I waited a couple hours for all the goons to rendezvous back to the estate. Only 10 goons showed up. When I asked where the rest were, one of them talked. This was all of them. The rest were either in jail or dead. I thought they were joking, but no one was laughing. Others had left under my nose, probably due to working conditions. I didn't know they were a bunch of pussies who couldn't handle getting their hands dirty. Then again, I think we went through 10 goons a day, mostly being used as meat shield. Yet, when I called them up, they said that I had no more money, saying that I had given it all to Give India last week. I don't know how Gupta figured out my other bank account, since the original died when I started hiding from the FBI. So I ask you, what rational decision must be made at this time? I've been planning a plan B ever since the mafia thing went south. To be honest, I didn't think I'd ever be able to get this far in the first place. But even when I did, I kind of started regretting it. Being a mob boss with competition ranging from the common thug to the US government is very stressful. Plus, I think the goons that are left are planning another coup, and I want to end up at the bottom of the lake. My plan is to first free Roderick from the Mexicans. The next part of plan B is to put all the casino money into another name, fake my identity, and finally fake my debt to hide out with my brother in Canada. I hear Canada is a very forgiving place, and that their mob gives you pancakes before they ice you. Gupta still knows I'm alive, since he knew to hack my fake account. Leaving the country will have him on my ass for sure, so once I'm in Mexico, I'll have to keep my face hidden and keep communication at a minimum. The Mexican mobs don't have that many foreign connections with Europe. I doubt that most of them have even heard of India. As I got my goons to begin the trip to the south, I called up Holly to tell her we needed to talk. We met her at the restaurant we had our first date at. She looked more worried than happy to see me, mainly since I hadn't called her in two months. Holly noticed the lack of goons with me and asked if I was okay. I said that I would be going to Mexico to save my brother. That I'd come to give her one gift remembering me by, just in case. Wednesday. We left today, on our way to Mexico. I left two men to stay at the estate, made sure they answered anyone who came knocking. The alibi? We went on a business team bonding exercise. On the way there, I was kind of afraid they might run us through by customs, but Border Patrol is very professional in their check. We made our way to the main gang's headquarters. We spent five minutes in the town before one of my goons got iced. It happened really fast too. First, my driver's head got bopped. The passenger goon didn't even have time to grab the wheel before we crashed. We immediately grabbed our weapons and hit down in the cars. A rain of bullet hit the cars. I couldn't hear my goons in the other car, but the sound of an explosion kind of helped me get a feeling of the situation. The Cholos busted down the windows and took me by the neck. I blasted one of their heads off, but another one whacked me in the head. I almost got knocked out, but I was able to stay conscious enough to see them apprehend my goons that hadn't blown up. I remember hearing a lot of yelling after they put a sack over my face and put me in what sounded like a trunk. It felt like hours before they took me out and brought me into an air-conditioned room. The goon told me, Stay here, gringo. The idiot didn't even know how to pronounce Greg. So I corrected him. For some reason, he looked at me funny. I swear, the education system has failed. The blow to the head hurt like a but it wasn't enough to stop me from taking in the situation. I tried making small talk with the guards, but they only spoke Spanish. It felt like an hour before a dude in a suit came and took me out of the cell. The guy said that his name was Emilio and they had to apologize for the excessive force used by the goons. They were told that nice looking cars were usually used by opposing drug dealers since the main gang doesn't use fancy cars. I asked them how they knew I was someone they should be letting go. What if I was a drug dealer who looked like an American? He said it was because Mexicans know better than to waltz into town sticking out like sore thumbs. I'm not gonna lie, that kinda hurt my feelings. He slowed me out of the cell and put a sack over my face, so I not know any exit or entrances in case I escaped. He brought me to a much nicer hallway that looked like that of a mansion or villa. Before he opened the door, he wanted me to know that if I were any other American, I'd be six feet under already, but the boss wanted me alive. He opened the doors, and sitting there was Alex Aruda. 
I didn't hesitate to reach for my weapon, but they had taken it off me during their apprehension. Alex Rudel laughed as his cholos raised their rifles. Emilio grabbed me by the arm and sat my ash down on a chair. Alex chuckled that he gave me credit for getting this far in the business. I told him to cut the shit and asked what he was doing in Mexico. Alex snapped his fingers as some men went to grab him some wine and poured him a drink. Alex took a sip and said that when he found out that Chirag Gupta was dead and that he had recently come back from a job full with holes, he simply put two and two together. He knew that Mr. Gupta would put his fingers at him immediately if his son were to die, since the Italians were in a pact with the Indians and the triads had always been on the rocks with the Guptas. Alex then said that he had gone to China for a few months to wait out the storm, while the brothers he left in charge would take the heat for him. However, he didn't anticipate me taking the reins, killing the brothers, along with Leland. Unfortunately, that didn't go well with the triad, knowing they lost a stake in the Americas. Yet, they knew better than to kill Aruda, and instead sent him here to take control of the main gang. How he did it, to him, wasn't my concern. Alex said that he knew I'd come here eventually. When I asked him how, he said that I already knew. Roderick. I asked him how he even knew that I'd come for Roderick, knowing that he was alive. Why not just send my goons? He sipped another glass of wine and stated that he examined my actions with Fregley and that he knew I did my personal work myself. All he had to do was take a hostage and send a messenger to give me a clue where to go. I was released since it seems that he hadn't figured out that I was broke. I was confused though. If he wanted me dead, he would have ordered his cholos to kill me in the town. I demanded to know why Alex kept me alive. Alex stood up and said that he ran into a dilemma in the business. A month ago, one of his cholos gave him a lead that the coalition and the port cartel were going to make an alliance against the Mangs. The two mobs hadn't attacked each other since then, making things even more suspicious. The head capos wanted to have a sit down in five days. Alex and Ruta predicted they would make their move and absorb their territory. Since the triad was already on the fence with whether they keep Alex Ruta due to last year's coup, simply fleeing would not be an option along with also declaring war, since if he did it, it would show his incompetence. The bastard stated that I had five days to earn the trust of these two capos and annihilate them from the inside. When I asked him how, he simply said that I did it once. I can do it again. I don't think this moron understands what happened in plain view. got down, got crazy. I honestly, I don't even know how I'm still alive. But he didn't care. He wanted them dead. And if they weren't, then Roderick was. Alex snapped his fingers again and said that Emilio and another hitman will help me out. Emilio was surprised by that statement because he blurred out a what before the cholos escorted us out of the room. The men took me to the lobby where the hitman was waiting for us. I tried introducing myself to him but the fool only spoke Spanish so that was a bust. I was able to get my fancy car back from the cholos. It was obviously taking anything that could be pawned from the car. Obviously I couldn't just build another stand like last time and wait to be recognized by a rival mob. No, this time I had to use my status and money to get in good with the mob. First though, I had to sell my fancy car for 20,000 pesos. It would have sold for a lot more, but the Mexicans have a shot car fee that makes them less expensive. Once I got that done, I got what was left of my original squad out of the cells. Then I had to go to a schedule and appointment with the Coalition's public business, which was tequila. Their mascot was a Yankee chewing bubblegum while shooting a gun. I mean, I'm not going to say it's inaccurate, but I think they could have at least given the dude a beer. The mom was actually able to schedule with us within an hour, probably since not a lot of people want to do business with the Mafia. On the way there, I tried briefing Emilio and the hitman that they would have to stay in the car with my goons so that didn't seem like I was from here. My goons weren't happy with that, Emilio more so. He said he was the one that would be giving orders, not me. I told the cholo that I was going to make this work, I would have to become as non-Mexican as possible. With that being said, he had a couple comments on my disguise. He called me a dumb bitch and left the car to take a smoke. Dumb bastard, I don't know what's up his me and my goons were able to meet with a couple of businessmen in the building and told them that I would like to contribute to their other productions and pursuits. They understood and brought in a lieutenant. I told them about my business up north and that I was looking to expand my connections with other capos. The lieutenant said that he liked the cut of my jib. However, before we could start the paperwork, I needed to take care of some business for him. A rogue him in of the coalition was recently spotted at the local McDonald's. They call him El Fuego. I didn't know why and I didn't care why. They gave me a picture and sent me on my way. I got my men and drove down to the local McDonald's to take care of business. At the moment, I felt like I had forgotten something, but I didn't mind. I briefed the him on what he needed to do when we got there. He grabbed an AK from the trunk and went to kill the pyro. I waited with my goons for 5 minutes and nothing was happening. I decided to take care of myself and got my goons to grab their weapons. I made a warning shot into the air. 7 or 10 people running out of the McDonald's. None of them looked like the target. I yelled for him to come out. No response. We dusted the McDonald's. The fool had to be dead so we went inside to claim the body. Instead we were met with a Molotov cocktail. I dove out of the way under a table as the inferno and a flamethrower and cooked my goons alive. Still better than any meat served here anyways. I rolled out of the table and pointed my gun at the pyromaniac, yet before I could pull the trigger, a cholo with a match and oil busted out of the bathroom with a hitman tied to a chair. He yelled that if I pulled the trigger, he'd kill the hitman. I think you know what I did next. The d fool exploded, with the aftermath catching the hitman on fire along with the cholo. I had mere seconds to escape the burger joint, yet before the fire engulfed the entrance, my goons were firing at something behind a car. I didn't understand why until it was a second pyro. 
I prepared a flank, but the building exploded, with the blast sent me flying into a pole. My hands and feet fell numb. All I could hear was the ringing in my head. The whole road was on fire, and I could no longer see or hear my goons. I heard footsteps coming near me, and I had a good guess of who it was. I could barely lift my revolver, and the fool had a flamethrower. I was thinking to myself that this would be one of a way to die, burned alive in front of a burning McDonald's. Oh well, I guess there's more bizarre ways to go. The pyro was getting closer and closer, and then suddenly, it hit me. I wasn't dead yet, and here I was giving up the moment things got tough. This wasn't me. I immediately started looking around for the pyro. I couldn't see him since he clearly hid behind the flames. I thought to myself what a miracle would be if there was some water or rain. And there, my stand, purple rain appeared. Just kidding. I shot the fire hydrant with the water shooting out and hitting the pyro onto his back. His gas tanks hit the ground hard enough, and with the compressed air, he was sent flying into the McDonald's. That son of a b deserved what happened to him. After what he did to my men, Melee was running over when he called after me. He asked what the hell went down and why everything was on fire. I briefed him on what happened and why McDonald's was on fire. All I wanted to do was hit up Hungry Jacks and get a Whopper. We cleared the area before the cops and the fire department arrived. Melee drove me back to Aruda's space. This time, the only ones in the car were me and him. What was left of my goons were embers along with the hitman. The whole thing had been a failure. I'd lost the men that, at the very least, were loyal to me. I don't trust the Mexicans, let alone Emilio. I think if he had come a minute earlier, he would have waited for me to die and then act. I made the call to the lieutenant that the deed was done and he scheduled me to meet with the boss tomorrow at noon. Four days remain. The morning of the meeting, I met with Emilio. He was playing some card game with picture-bearing clubs. I told him what I had to do and where to meet the capo. He asked what my plan was to take him out. I said that I didn't have a plan at the moment. I told him that I would just wing it and that was good enough for him. Before he left, however, I smuggled an old pocket watch with a blade hidden inside. Emilio and I went to where the big man wanted us to meet. There his cholos greeted us and searched us for weapons. All they found was my pocket watch. When asked how I got it, I made up a story. The cholos led me to the capo waiting their brief room. When the doors opened, the capo turned out to be a chick. Before we got down to business, she made their phones were confiscated and taken out of the room. Weird, right? Anyways, I told Emilio to wait on the other side of the table. I agreed to myself to her when she returned with a scoff saying that she was surprised to see a gringo alive in Mexico. I simply ignored it and opened my briefcase and showed her my analytics in the past year. She was impressed. Emilio walked to the back of the room and accidentally broke the clock. When the capo asked what time it was, I took out my pocket watch and gave what was coming to her. I quickly covered her mouth and pushed her under the table. When the chose burst in the room asking what was going on, I grabbed the capo's pistol and acted fast. Emilio grabbed their AKs and yelled at me to move. We made our way to the front only having to kill three guards. It was odd, but I'm not questioning luck. We were almost out when we came across the dude in the parking lot. Emilio and I jumped out of the way. Emilio fired at the guy with his rifle, but the bullets deflected off his armor. The heavy calmly reloaded his weapon and fired another rocket at us. This time, it hit a car and the follow-up knocked Emilio off his feet and onto the pavement. I didn't know what else to do except charge at him with my gun. He was repaired though and shot my hand with his pistol. The heavy tossed his gun away, wanting to finish me off properly. He aimed his bazooka at me and apologized for the mess in advance. Before I could be blown to bits, I took out the pistol one last time and shot not at the guy, but at the rocket in the bazooka. The heavy flew all the way back to the wall of the building. Although armor was still on, his body must have been mushed from the impact. I didn't waste time thinking about it and carried Amelia to our car. I sped off with Cholos firing at us, but thank god none of them hit me. Amelia was still knocked out by the time we made it back to Arudas. I saw the aftermath on TV and was happy to hear that the Kappa was dead. Aruda told me that I had before then to eliminate the other captors before then. Three days remain. Aruda told me that the Kappa was apparently going to appear at a fashion festival at the capital tomorrow, despite recent events. He was mainly doing it to show that he has no fear. Now, at first I wasn't expecting for him to pick up, but lo and behold, he did. Yet he had more news for me than I had for him. Turns out the FBI raided my estate and interrogated my single goon. He gave them information, and if the FBI knows I'm here, then so does the mob. I begged Jerry to come down to help me, and I explained my situation to him. He said that helping me wouldn't matter because I'm already dead by the end of the year, or some BS. I told him that I would pay him all the money left in my bank account, just so that he would help me. Which is zero, but he doesn't know that. He stopped talking for a minute, but then got back on the phone. He agreed. My a** was saved. I was so excited that I didn't know Emilio was at my door. He had to come to thank me for saving him yesterday. He knew that if situations were reversed, I'd be dead. I laughed it off, because how else are you supposed to respond to that? And I told him I was just doing what was right. He said that he would help me now, not as a job, but for destiny. Two days remaining. Jerry came by this morning. I got him through without Ruta knowing. I got him into my room and briefed him on the situation. I told him my plan. He said I was a dumb which wasn't wrong. He told me that the only way to get in, kill the Kappa, and get out was through sniping. I couldn't do the same thing like last time, so there would be a huge crowd this time. I asked him if he could snipe. 
He can snipe, but he has no idea where the capital will show up or what the lay of the land was. He asked for at least a picture. Never before had I seen a more disappointed person in my life. Just as we were about to argue, Emilio came in and pointed his gun at Jury, asking who he was. I explained to him that Jury is a professional mobster who was more than suited to help me. Emilio asked how I know him. I told him that I killed his boss. Emilio grabbed me and closed the door. He told me that this wasn't a good idea, but I told him it was the only idea we had. He thought about it and re-entered the room. One day remains. When I arrived at the balcony with Jury to pick a spot where to kill the capo, Jury said that wherever I picked, we only had one shot at this. I picked next to one of the catering tables. He asked me some questions before I left, like, where would I want to go on vacation or something? I told him Canada, because why not? Next, Amelia disguised herself. He taught me how to act and talk like a Mexican without knowing any Spanish. We were all ready to go until we got there. Amelia and I split up to search for the capo, agreeing we should know based on how people reacted and talked to them. An hour or two passed until I noticed one man was getting more attention than the rest. The one was saying things in Spanish next to him, repeating, El jefe. I know that Spanish word meant boss, so I tried getting close to him, but cholos suck and suck-ups were trying to kiss his boots so much I couldn't even see him. The main event started with multiple women showing up in these weird ass fits. I don't know, I guess I'm just uncultured. I started noticing some of the boot kissers giving El Jefe a drink, which she would then decline. This was my chance. I grabbed a drink from the catering table and raised it to Jury so that he would see it. I walked over to El Jefe and offered him a drink. He declined and just as he did, Jury fired, killing the fool. Yet no one reacted even with the guy's gray matter everywhere. It was then that I realized, the girls, the boot kickers. El Jefe must have been a fake. The boot kissers, the girls, they were the lure. It was a trap. Just as the last girl left the stage, a man with a bomb strapped to his chest while tied to a wheelchair was pushed onto the stage. It was Emilio. I couldn't do anything except to watch. I immediately ran from the stage with Emilio's death. Men with assault rifles flooded the area, stating the real Kappa wanted El Gringo dead. I ran for it in all the confusion. People were shot and women were killed. I barely managed to get to my car when one of them exploded. The monsters were screaming that they knew the man gang was up to this and declared war on them. I knew then that I had to get to Arruda's estate before he could ice Roderick. I noticed some fool was trying to get in a car, so I knocked him and stole his keys, making beeline to the estate. As I turned the radio on to hear something on the news, I looked outside and watched as the clocks turned to midnight. Zero days remain. Hey, I'm writing this before I go into the estate looking for Roderick. I parked the car a mile away from the estate, since so I noticed tanks were rolling there, I didn't want to get blown away. I ran through the jungle and got to the back of the estate. By the time I got there, the place was on fire. All I hear were men screaming and shots being fired. I loaded the assault rifle I stole before I left and charged in. I ran down the corridor shouting, Where is Roderick? Looking for Rudas so I could put one to his head. I thought to myself he must be in his cell, but first I needed the key. Some of them got me, but I didn't care. The general in my body my body made me feel like I could do anything right now and I wanted a Ruda. Before I knew it, I heard a loud whistle come closer and closer until I realized it was a tank shell. I did what I could only do and jump for it. One of my feet may have been broken, but I was alive. It didn't matter. All I wanted was Roderick. I shot my way through men and fire and finally made it to Aruda's office. I shot open the door, yet when I did, Aruda was ready. The bastard was waiting for me in his chair, sipping a glass of wine. I pointed my rifle at him, threatening to nail him unless he showed me where Roderick was. Instead, he laughed at me and said that I reminded him of Roderick, moments before he buried him in cement. I pulled the trigger, but all I heard were clicks. I see. Before I kill you, Greg, I want to know that even if you do beat me here now, you won't be safe. They will find you, and you will die. My life isn't the one you should be concerned about right now. I unloaded all my bullets until there were none left. Aruda fell backwards out of the window, and out of my life. With that, I left. Nothing gained or won. Everyone I cared about was either dead or no longer able to see me. A fugitive of the law and the mob. My only purpose now is that of a pawn.